yeah, thanks uh, so much for, for pulling us all together and uh, all the volunteers. It's a really amazing uh, event. Uh, it's free. It's part of these days. I think it's free. And I'm a library science school dropout. Um, I used to work for Cal State University Library Systems before I uh, went into the world of design. So. Um, I'm, a, you know, I'm a little uh, content nerd at heart, um, you know, I, um, I can't stand to look at a bookshelf that is, has no order uh, to it, so um, you know, those aspects of me resonate pretty much with you know, every, in my everyday life, um, even to the point where um, I have two small children, a three-year-old and a seven-month-old, and I'm um, starting to instill in them the, the value of um, putting your toys back where you found them. Yeah, so uh, I work with PayPal, um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about designing mobile payment experiences. Um, it's uh, Swipe Dip or Tap is uh, what it's called. So I, I felt like um, someone asked me a question earlier. Um, what dip means. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been working in the, in the kind of payments world for too long, I think. Um, so content, context, challenge. Uh, dip refers to these newfangled uh, cards that we have now where you have to stick them into the reader um, rather than swipe over. So that's what that means. <laughs> um, if you have questions um, uh, later or throughout, um, throughout today, my Twitter handle is there at Skipper. Um, yeah, so um, before I was at PayPal, I was at um, Capital One, and, and I also worked uh, with Visa before that uh, to bring uh, NFC payments to, to different markets. And um, you know, generally, when you're working with financial services or anything else related to you folks, okay, great. Um, well, then you're not used to um, uh, yeah, talking about financial stuff in these types of conferences, but um, I will say um, that there is some profanity in this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so, working financial services, you can definitely um, relate to that. Um, yeah, so um, we generally deal with numbers and how people feel about them. Um, it's, it's, it's a really complex space to work in. It's the kind of regulations, there's legacy systems, um, you know, it's you know, like any other complex um, uh, area. It's you know, it can be really tough, um, especially when you're um, you know, new designer coming out of school and you know, you just learn how to how to deal with these really sensitive types of uh, sensitive type of information. Um, and so, a lot of those experiences uh, led me to write uh, this book, which came out um, a year and a half ago or so. Um, don't have any with me, but uh, happily, uh, I'll be fine with it. I'm uh, interested. Um, we've been quite busy at PayPal. We just um, updated our mobile app. Um, it's uh, you know, a huge thing for us. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's now a lot, it's much more simpler now to track your spending and uh, send money to friends um, for customers in all the 26 markets that we operate with. So, we have time, go ahead and update your apps if you have it. Let us know what you think. Um, every day we're faced with uh, this question. How do we make money safer, easier to understand, more accessible, and generally faster? Um, these are really simple questions, um, but they're much harder to answer. Um, and today I'll talk about a little bit about why that is. Um, you know, when we're talking about things like NFT payments, uh, which was really my kind of first foray into um, how payment systems work, um, you know, when we were testing things in America, it was, it was really difficult. In South Korea, Japan, other places, they've been using kind of this tap and pay um, method for over a decade. It's not technically a new thing. Um, in the US, you know, it's, you know, this is a way to use your phone that we're, we don't have any experience with, and it can be a little strange at first. Um, this is a very scientific slide. 
between the two areas that people tend to follow when we would, we would bring these different experiences into the usability lab. So it was either, um, oh my god, this is amazing, I'm going to throw my wallet into the lake, <laughs> or, oh my god, I don't want this on my phone. Um, so two very uh, you know, visceral reactions. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of uh, reasons why that could be. Um, some of them is just the mechanics was, could be very alien to people. Um, when you, you know, the way NFC works is you walk up to one of these contraptions in a store, and you just tap your phone on this pad at the top. Um, these things all look different, by the way. That's a completely separate presentation. Um, <laughs> So that's what, you're, that's what you're supposed to do as a, as a consumer. Um, in the lab, we were finding a lot of people actually wanted to slide their phone through the... <laughs> 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 um, which is funny, but it's, you know, if you think about it, it's the only context that you've had with this, this thing, um, is to yes, yeah, swipe your card with a bunch of numbers. So, uh, and folks are getting slimmer, so... <laughs> so it was it was these types of uh, challenges that led me to write this book, and um, it really started as kind of a playbook for, for myself, but also for my for my team, um, you know, to uh, to better address some of the, the core user experience issues um, when we talk about mixing uh, financial services and devices. Um, the um, the standard that I typically advise people is that new pandemic experiences need to be convenient, meaningful, safe. Um, historically, we've always looked for ways to evolve our payment systems to be, to be faster and more convenient, um, while still retaining the significance of those transactions. Um, and you know, new payment systems should fall under the same standards that, uh, that what we use today. Um, by convenient, we're talking about it makes someone's life easier, but it still feels natural and fits into their life. Um, by meaningful, we're talking about there's a sense of worth to that interaction, and you know, the wider community can, can agree that this is a, a valid payment method. It's understood that this is something that um, can be used in this particular scenario. Um, in my safe, it's a little more obvious, unassailable security and absolute trust that my personal privacy is being maintained. Um, so money is really old. <laughs> Uh, we've been transacting for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and our mental models and expectations around commerce um, are, are rooted in our long history. Um, there's a lot of great books about this particular subject, but generally people think that we were, you know, we started by bartering goods and, and labor in some cases, uh, you know, in, in, in small communities. And, this is um, this is great and easy to it makes sense, um, but it doesn't scale very well. It doesn't allow your community to grow, and then you also run into situations like um, let's say you're these guys up here and you brought a bunch of fish in the market, and then you get there and there's another guy with fish. I'm like, I don't need fish, so um, there's a guy with axes and tools, and maybe I need those things, so that's good. Um, but what if he's out of axes or something like that? You can see how those types of problems don't crop up. Um, so there is the first lesson, really, is that friction fuels innovation. We're always looking for, for more convenient, faster ways to, to get the things that we need. Money is not um, you know, the object. The thing that we want to use the money for is the object that we desire. Um, the Mesopotamians found ways around this kind of bartering um, the logistics of bartering by uh, issuing these tokens that would represent different types of goods, textiles, shirts, smell. So you could use these as a way to exchange them without having to like haul a ton of rope to the market. You could just bring these tokens 
Um, and, and we find examples of these kinds of tokens across cultures all over the world. Um, the Chinese green parade uh, is today, so there's an example um, from the 12th century. They, they uh, realized that we could start using uh, small coins to represent uh, a store of value. Um, and these were great because they were you know, somewhat rare in terms of the material, and they were harder to, um, uh, to duplicate. Um, and uh, it was just much more convenient um, than having to carry around um, you know, practical goods. Um, but these coins in particular uh, were, were quite heavy. If you had a ton of them, if you're really, really prosperous, um, you had to carry them around with these kind of strings, and they were just like these big tables of brass coins. You can just imagine trying to, like, if you had to carry this around today, how bizarre that would be. Um, and cumbersome. So they very quickly um, devised uh, paper notes or promissory notes that would um, you know, represent the denomination of these coins, in this case, 10 of them, whatever that amounted to um, at that particular time. And this was portable or to share sense of the community that this had value, uh, mostly because there was generally a, a very stern warning coming on the uh, uh, set of blocks tonight. Okay. So we see examples of this you know, throughout the time, and when it continues to evolve, um, some forms of payment quickly become obsolete, and at each stage in this evolution, there's new design challenges that uh, you know we. We have to consider as designers, as content writers, as developers. Um, even even credit cards took a long time to to gain wider adoption. It came about around the late 50s or 60s. Um, it was very complex if you were um, a merchant and you weren't sure if this card was the, was um, credible. You had no other way other than to look up in a binder of nefarious our users, I guess, and uh, it was just really not a practical system at first, and it just took several decades before it was more widely accepted. Um, you see this in other examples um, with ATMs. Uh, this is an early uh, ATM from the late 60s, early 70s, I'm not sure why this keeps my uh, Um, it's called Tilly, the, the all-time teller in the first national of Atlanta. Um, and they were finding that people were really kind of scared of using the ATM. It was kind of this cold machine. Um, so they started to put uh, this like, like nice space on the ATM. And they gave it a, pers gave it a personality. There were commercials and jingles um, to, to, to gain wider adoption. And, uh, you know, this is this, this was this, this bank saw this as the necessity to gain um, gain the users trust and wanted to use that people were just deferring to going into the into the lobby and talking to a person that felt more natural. Um, of course, even now ATMs are starting to feel a little antiquated. I don't know about you. Um, I don't want to be bank anymore, so I can say that. Uh, <laughs> there's a great economist who's who's talked about the, the transition of technology and. and Financial services. Uh, his name is Louis C.K. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just play this, this quote for you. Standing at the ATM room counter made me go like this. Stupid. The fuck you complain about? You push on the button and, and your money comes out fucking slots. <laughs> Something that we we 
we work hard for. We have, um, you know, we all use it differently. We might keep it in a, in a wallet, we might keep it in a mattress, we might not, you know, not trust it, so we use some other form of currency that's not generally widely accepted. Um, and we, we, we spend it on things that we care about. Um, the, the context of um, you know, when people might use money in their daily life is something you have to consider when you're designing these experiences. Um, a commerce transaction might be a very, very small fraction of the customer's daily life. Uh, it's a window of like maybe 10, 20 minutes that they happen to go down the store and pick something up. Um, and within that, it could be only you know, 10 seconds or so when they're actually paying for something. So it's a very, very small window to make a good impression, but it's also important to consider this is not the type of experience that someone's just like staring at a device for hours like other, uh, other uh, areas. Um, and this, if you are transacting a lot, um, the volume of how much you pay can kind of detract from your perception of how much money you have. Um, so in this regard, information is, is powerful, and the, the advantage of mobile payments is that it can tell you things that the cash and cards can't tell you about. How much you're spending, and where you're spending it. Uh, this is a screenshot from Simple Bank, which is a, a great service. Uh, and they tell you um, in very plain language where you spend your money and how that affects your balance. It, it, it makes users feel um, more in control of, of their money and how it's being used. Um, as opposed to just money just, just, just like disappearing into the ether. Another, another challenge of working on new kind of payment systems is money works just fine as it is. There's nothing preventing us from walking down the street and buying whatever, whatever we want, right? at least in this country. Um, and you know, a lot of critics of mobile payments will say that if their solution to a problem doesn't exist. And um, you know, they're, they're right. We, you know, if you if you work in some of the digital payment spaces, um, you know, you've got a, a long hill to climb. This is from a survey last year uh, that was entered the uh, payment uh, methods in the U.S. And uh, you know, cash, cards, even checks are still you know, widely used. Um, so, you know, we have to we move up to a register and we decide from which of these methods we're going to use at a particular time. There's a lot of factors that go into that. And um, one of them is just speed. Um, which of these options at this time is going to be the, the fastest way to make this happen, right? Um, so these, these are generally the standards which are held against when you're designing these interactions. Um, checks take around just over a minute. Uh, the ND cards, uh, almost 50 seconds, the other card was a little bit shorter, uh, cash is faster. Um, so these are you know, today's standards of user experience in terms of uh, how long I'm going to devote time to you know, paying this way. And if you're just over a minute, um, you're going to risk uh, becoming obsolete. Objects. And no one wants to be that guy. <laughs> uh, at the register, like fruitlessly mocking your device on uh, another device and another tactic. Um, the Japanese have a phrase for this. I, I, I can't remember what it is. Hopefully, someone can get out to Google after this and tweet it. It's a really, it's a really, it's it's a phrase for someone who is taking too long at the front of the line. <laughs> you don't want to do that kind of thing. You have to favor the speed over the spectrum. There's a lot of there's a lot of temptation in these types of uh, interactions to design these very like you know tons of transitions and all this like cards sliding in and out of stuff and um, you know kind of skeuomorphic um, trends. Um, you know in our in our quest to design something that's beautiful and you know, delights the user, um, you do have to balance that with sheer efficiency and speed. Um, when I said money works just fine already, this would not be a presentation about financial services and there were disclaimers. Um, so uh, raise your hand if you've ever been affected by credit or debit card fraud. You like lost your card, someone stole it. This is 
Um, how much money was lost in 2014 to global back credit and the front line? Um, it's a staggering number. We all end up paying for it. Um, and in the US, it's 49% of this number. So. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it's pretty bad. And one of the reasons why Apple Pay was so groundbreaking is because it was the first time there were there were two kind of behind the scenes things happening. Uh, one of which was called tokenization, which means basically that uh, the card number that's presented to the reader when you tap it is not your actual card number. It's a different card number that is temporary. And it's a proxy for your actual card number. Right, so um, there's, there's local protection in there, and they also require that you use touch ID or, or biometric um, authorization. So those two things have generally not been together in the same payment system, and that's why um, it's such a leap forward in terms of the way we transact. And that leads me to the next question, which is security is more than just technology. Um, it's, uh, now, now more than ever, users are cognizant of financial privacy, and then you have breaches of Target, you have this whole Apple versus the FBI thing. Security is important, um, that's obvious, but it's not just about you know, encryption standards and the environment, um, kind of the, the system environment where personal information is stored and communicated. It's also about aesthetics. Um, you, know, you do judge with book by time. Um, and that can play a part in the perception of security and trust. Um, this is the Euro. Um, it's always strange when I do this presentation in the US, but I don't know. In the UK, I don't have to explain what this is. Um, so when they were designing the Euro, brand new currency, right? At least in our time. Um, it's uh, you know, the IMF commissioned designers across Europe to submit designs for this new money that they're going to create. Um, this is the one of the winning designs, obviously. This is uh, by uh, Robert Kalina, who's an Austrian designer, um, who won the kind of competition. He used a lot of um, kind of very stately, iconic examples of architecture you might see in Europe, Roman arches, aqueducts. Um, they all convey a sense of stability and longevity. Um, this is one of the rejected designs for the Euro. Um, by uh, uh, Roger Schwind, I think his name. And he took a different approach. It was, you know, I want something that's abstract, that, that is, is whimsical and reflects kind of the, the sense of vibrancy of European culture, um, you know, which, which makes sense, you know, if this is meant to represent many different countries. Um, but in, in market tests, in early market tests, the, the reactions that they got from customer, from consumers, from money handlers was, it looks fake, it looks like play money. Um, you know, what you can take from that in terms of interface design is, you know, would you trust an app with your financial information that looks like this? Um, you know, probably not. Maybe it breaks some of the standards of the, of the OS in terms of interface uh, guidelines that you've come to expect. Maybe, even though it's got your bank's name on it, it just kind of, it doesn't look trustworthy. There's, a, there's kind of an intangible element to that. Um, and you have to be cognizant of that. Um, you know, why things need to just look good. It's not just about aesthetics. Um, onboarding, the first few screens that you have in a mobile experience are really important. Um, it's a key phase in the customer's journey, especially if you're not quite sold on the value proposition. Um, it's really tempting to revert to kind of marketing speak. Um, this is a, an app called PuaPay, and uh, the way they describe their security standard is our patented security model surprises even the security experts. Which is, which is nice, but um, it doesn't, it's not really helpful. Um, Venmo and Level Up call out the industry standards that they use when you, when you sign in or you add a card. Um, and you know, users may not understand what these terms mean, and you can. Yeah, you could probably prove this by making these tappable and you know, what does this encryption standard mean and what is PCI compliance. Um, but at least they, at least customers will, will feel like you're acknowledging their concerns about security. Again, we're more cognizant about this stuff than we were before. Um, 
and uh, there are new security standards that, that as consumers we expect, we expect to use touch ID or fingerprint scanning, we expect to use a passcode or a pin code to, to protect these apps. Again, this is going back to making the user you know, have complete control of how they pay. Uh, finally, um, transactions are a conversation that are. So, um, if you go back to the rituals of, and, and language of, of early markets, um, you know, you'd walk into the market, you would you'd see familiar merchants that you saw you know, every month. There was a there were greetings exchanged. There was a uh, you know, there was some debate. There was bargaining. Um, we've been, we've been this is a very social kind of activity, and even today, when we go into a store, you know, we're greeted maybe by lots of signage. Uh, there's, uh, you know, you walk into the register, they ask you, did you find anything you're looking for? There's all this uh, stimuli, stimuli coming at you, and you know, we still expect these types of signals um, in the form of on-screen instructions or feedback when we're using our phone today. So. Um, that includes things like, uh, you know, we're, we're still carrying around cards now. We're not quite, again, we're not throwing our wallets out of the, you know, into the, into the bay just yet. Um, so we still have a visual association to what our cards look like. If you close your eyes right now, you can probably picture the, the branding of the cards you use the most. Um, so for now, we kind of have to, to show those, um, those, those visual cues so that I'm absolutely certain how I'm paying at that given time, which part I'm using. Um, and, that, and, and then in terms of like error situations, you know, designing for when things go wrong is just as important as designing the happy paths. Um, you need to provide actionable instructions if something's not quite right, you know, well, what am I supposed to do here? And you should be using um, all the facilities that the mobile device gives you vibration, uh, audio cues to, to tell you what's going on. And, you know, an artifact of old commerce is, is the receipt, right? It says, I'm done. I'm, I finished this transaction. I feel confident right now I can help out the store. Um, this is when you uh, order ahead on the, the Starbucks app and they give you a receipt of, you know, what you pay for, where you, where you pay for it. Um, it, adds, it adds weight and significance to the transaction. This is true of a lot of digital experiences, but you know, I, I firmly believe they could direct, could build trust in a new product, and if you fall short of that, uh, you know, of the UX in any way, you can betray that trust. And, uh, we have to consider uh, historical and personal context when we're designing new ways to pay. That's it. Thanks. Hi, um, so my question is in payments. So there's a platform essentially, so you have the consumers as well as the merchants. How does solving for the merchants, because they're not making any money, and to some degree they're also more um, sensitive about payments than consumers, how do you actually change your process where do you have access to principles that you also buy by? You have is how much does change the process? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, part of this is about education, right? It's educating the user, you know, how to use this thing if they're unfamiliar with it. But it's also about educating merchants in terms of what to expect from this new way to pay. Um, it's about, uh, you know, all others. There are customer service, um, you know, organizations within most companies, and so you want to make sure that uh, you know, your customer service team is aware of. Um, how these apps work and what to do when something goes wrong, um, and part of it is, you know, there's also um, there's a there's an example in the book that I don't have with me, which is um, there there are a few times when I've walked into Whole Foods and there are um, there's like a terminal where you just tap your phone onto them and they'll sometimes place advertisements on top of them, like uh, you know, don't forget to bring it back. 
um, just covering up the interface completely. So we get up there, like, I don't know what to do with this thing. I saw the Apple Pay commercial, it's easy. Um, so part of that is educating merchants to make sure that you know, the signage that they use, that the, um, you know, just a general overview of how this, this system works, um, to make sure that training is, is in effect in, in the places and regions in which it's going to uh, take place. Hi. Um, so my question is, um, regarding payment, as you just mentioned, like, it, it's really important to make it fast, make it easy, time matters, but I do know, like, when money involves legal, often comes into play regarding the design, like, we want to make it simple, but legal is there's requirement, and do you have any kind of, like, interesting example regarding how and a design battle with Lego regarding making it simple and making it easy for users? Yes, um, great, great question. Um, so, I've, I've, we were talking about this earlier. Um, I've, I've found that um, you know, often when there are legal reviews and you have someone come in and say, well, regulations say we need to show these five things, or we use these phrases. Um, a lot of um, regulations are written around um, the, you know, the desire for clear, clear disclosure to, uh, to the consumer, right? To make it absolutely clear what this thing is and how it works. Um, one approach I've taken is illustrating how um, you know, verbose legal content can obscure the purpose of the regulation, which is to make sure the user is clearly informed. If you can illustrate examples of here is that content with the language that you've given me, and then here is a clear, a more concise way to say that. You can illustrate how you're still meeting the guidelines or the purpose of the regulation, and how following, following, following the regulation to the letter can obscure the purpose of the regulation. Um, my wife is an attorney, and the thing that she tells me all the time is that the law is open to interpretation. Um, so. So, as a designer, you have uh, tools at your disposal to get consumer feedback on these two different approaches that you might uh, propose to them, and to try to get their mind on this. I think there's a question down here the first one in that group. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, my question is um, so, everything that PayPal does. What is stopping Visa or any major bank from doing the same things? Uh, why does PayPal even exist? Why aren't these, these banks or Visa or MasterCard doing the same thing? Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that I can answer in behalf of my company. <laughs> um, as, a, as someone who's been a PayPal user for a long time, I can say that, um, and I've worked at banks as well, uh, you know, banks have a lot of um, irons in the back, right? They've got branches, they've got a website, they've got uh, credit services, they've got customer support. They, you know, there are large, there are large organizations that um, are driven on um, just getting people to use the system. PayPal is unfortunately different, but um, the the advantage that you have of over something like banks are or you know, checks, for example, are things like, you know, I can use PayPal to tell me, you know, what my transaction history, you can look at my transaction history and see, like, okay, here's why my balance is what it is. And I can aggregate all of the different banks and cards that I use into one place so I get a, a wider picture of how I'm using my money. Um, and this is another great example of that. Um, whereas banks are very much siloed, they don't want you to like using other banks. There's there's a competitive um, element there, right? Um, so part of it is being an aggregator of your finances. Um, another is we were talking earlier about about fraud. Um, you know, one and in terms of and like ways you can be a proxy is for potential fraudsters and card that you have in your wallet. Um, there's a value you never have to use your card. Um, it's stored somewhere in a secure area, and you go check out online or you check out in the store. You never have to pass that card over to someone. It's always um, protected. Um, with Target, um, 
you know, they were using state-of-the-art payment systems, and you know, somehow it was a way for a back door to be um, exposed, and you know, millions and millions of people's cards were compromised. So, you know, I would say part of it is the fact that a lot of banking systems are built on very, very old technology. Yeah, I mean, Visa and Mastercard are not they're not consumer brands per se. I mean, they like you don't go into a Visa, yeah. whatever. But they provide the the systems and the rails for all of this and everything take place. Um, but but yes, uh, I would say that you know even even PayPal relies on the systems of Visa, Mastercard, and American Express to. Uh, make these payments possible. We, we work together. We don't compete against each other. Uh, so, there's a question in the back. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you, you talked about doing um, user research. Um, I was wondering if there were some specific things you were looking for that let you know that your design was ready to go. It was ready for prime time. Were, were there some stumbling blocks that you had in like earlier iterations that you knew that you had to overcome? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, in the Bay Area, we're, there's a temptation to just kind of, okay, we're going to do usability testing, you know, we're going to do it like down the street or at the coffee shop or whatever. Um, I think one, one hallmark is that you've tested your experience in many markets. Um, money, again, is it's a personal thing, it's a cultural artifact. Uh, people feel very differently in different parts of the world about it. Um, and the, uh, you know, if, you're, if your design is performing well in multiple markets, I'd say that's one indicator. Um, and also, when you, if you test with people with a variety of backgrounds and experience levels with technology, um, you know, you will know, have early adopters in the room, and then you'll have people who are, you know, less comfortable about this particular idea, having, you know, a digital means to use money. Um, if you can convince those customers that this is a, a safe and a, and a, a unique way to transact, I think that's that's the only part that you can pass. Cool. What time for one more? Yeah, I hear you with your microphone, so I think. Some of the designs you were showing had a lot of skeuomorphism, like actual pictures of little cards and a receipt that looks like a paper receipt. And are, is there any aspect of the payment experience you think it's going to be really awesome to get rid of once people are ready for it? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's, in this particular case, there's such a thing as good friendship. There's, um, there's we were talking about uh, you know, meaningfulness and the transaction and having to see these artifacts. You know, um, I think some of it could be, you know, maybe getting rid of cards at, at some point in the future. Maybe we don't need to show a picture of a card, maybe it's just a logo. Um, you know, and I, I'm saying that mostly as a designer, it's like cards are freaking huge. You know, like they take up a third of the screen, so that's just more of a, like a personal thing. Um, you know, that, that's a great question. I. Um, you know, there, there are companies like Square who have looked at, um, you know, ways that, hey, do I even need to take anything out of my wallet? Can I just walk into a store and by geolocation they know that I'm in the store and just charge my account? Um, you know, that's so much more efficient. Um, but you have to be careful about um, removing some of that significance uh, from a transaction um, to the point where you know, you're still cognizant that this money is, in your, is, is just flowing out of your wallet, right? Yes. So you have to balance the, you know, the, the artifacts of payment systems with uh, ease and efficiency. But yeah, I, I'm not sure I can move the best thing to that question. But that's good. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much.